Sean Kelly, it's so nice to see you and wonderful to be in conversation. I know you've been in Japan recently. You teach at CIS, California Institute of Integral Study, and you've done this wonderful paper for our conference at Oak Spring on the Gaia sensibilities and the era of Gaia that you feel is, is upon us, and many of us agree with that perspective. So, so I don't want you to go through your whole paper, but I'd love for you to develop a little bit more. First of all, let's just talk about what is Gaia, and then we'll go into uh, bits of your paper. Why do you feel we're in this particular era? And maybe what are the tools that will help us go into that era? But let's begin with a sense of what is Gaia? What does this term mean? <clears throat> what a great question. And it's so good to be with you uh, this morning, Mary Evelyn. Uh, well, you know, Gaia is different things to different people. Of course, it's a word that some people love to use and, and other people hate to use. Uh, but um, uh, as you know, it was proposed initially um, apart from being the name of a Greek goddess, was proposed by uh, James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis uh, in connection with the so-called Gaia hypothesis and then the Gaia theory, uh, which was really the precursor to what now is called Earth System Science. So in Lovelock and Margulis' sense, it was a word that described a new uh, insight into the nature of uh, this living planet, that uh, the planet as a whole is a self-organizing system which uh, includes both what we normally think of as the living components, the biosphere, and the so-called non-living parts, the abiotic environment, that are nevertheless coupled in a single self-organizing system whose nature, uh, uh, including you know, the fine-tuning of the, of the ingredients of the atmosphere, the chemical composition of the oceans, even the plate tectonics, have all been, in a sense, orchestrated by and for life over uh, unimaginable stretches uh, of time. So this is the original Gaia hypothesis, Gaia theory. <clears throat> and um, the, the, the first part to recognize is that uh, in contrast to the, the dominant modern scientific view that sees a, uh, a kind of gulf between living and non-living matter, the original Gaia theory invites us to see the whole planet as in some sense alive uh, in, in its own unique way. So that's the, um, the most important part, I think. But um, uh, of course, uh, the other element that has changed radically even since the initial Gaia hypothesis or the Gaia theory is the place, the question of the place of the human in all of this. So initially the human was seen as just one more member of the biotic community. Uh, but uh, since then, so in the last 50 years, uh, as you know, the human has become, as Thomas Berry was one of, one of the first to recognize in such a big way, and 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 then uh, with Brian Swim and and uh, and you and uh, all of the people who have been so influenced by by this uh, tradition coming out of Thomas, the the human has become uh, a geological force in its own right. Which is why seems that now the consensus is to name the era that we've moved into uh, the human the area uh, the era of the human the Anthropocene so one uh, the question then is what is the human in this guy in complex is it is it just a kind of cancerous growth that has come out of the biosphere um, or is it playing some critical role even an intentional role uh, in this uh, 4.6 billion year evolutionary uh, drama that is um, the story of the living earth. Yeah, so maybe we should also pause and say there's other communities like indigenous communities who have had a sense of the livingness of the earth, right? And this reciprocity and deep reverence uh, for ecosystems, the biota, um, the flowers, the fauna, the, the plant, animal, fish, bird world. So the sense of Gaia, while ancient, as an ancient Greek term, while ancient in human thinking and consciousness, um, is being recovered through a science lens, the earth system science, um, through a literature lens, uh, and so on. So what's new, do you think, about this um, understanding of Gaia in our times? Mm, mm -hmm, mm. 
Yeah, well, I think uh, uh, as as your work and, and with John and others in the religion and ecology community especially have uh, drawn out so well, the, the world religions uh, and the uh, earth-based religions, religious traditions that go so much further back even than the first axial age uh, world religions, all have had a sense of, <clears throat> of the earth as, as alive, as ensouled, uh, as enchanted. Um, and um, that's something that we need to recover, both, um, I say we, I mean, the, the dominant scientific tradition and uh, most proponents even of, of uh, Gaia theory or earth system science. But I guess what's new in um, the traditions that I'm drawn to that that like to invoke the name and idea of Gaia is that we now have a sense of uh, the planet in the way that we understand the planet as a cosmological entity that is an integral expression of a you know, almost 14 billion year ongoing evolutionary adventure. Uh, and we know the detailed history of this planet, uh, its physiology, um, from from the, you know, the the molten rock, uh, plate tectonics, all the way to the various spheres uh, in, in, up to and including our own moment, which is a really new revelation um, that uh, the indigenous traditions and the first axial traditions of world religions just didn't know. So it's it's a very new revelation, which, however, was prepared for and could not have happened without the deep cultural work that these religious traditions did over the thousands of years. Yes, and uh, coming back to how it's different, how it's new, and, and both the positive and maybe resisting sides of this, you've mentioned ecosystem science and that sense of a more holistic understanding of how the various branches of science are working together, especially for ecological understandings, ecological solutions. So moving beyond sort of the silo uh, mentality of science. So I'd love you to say a little bit more about uh, system science, systems thinking perhaps, um, and then we'll come back for another question about science and Gaia. Yeah, well, so uh, yeah, I'm fascinated by, by uh, uh, how system science could emerge. I mean, normally, there, there's sort of a, a standard story, and then I think there's a deeper story. But the standard story is that system science just comes out of out of uh, 19th and early 20th century hardcore reductionistic physics and engineering, and, and actually uh, out of the military in trying to um, have greater success in, in predicting and controlling. Um, oh, oh, the yeah. lights. We have, we have a light issue here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it probably doesn't matter for you, but okay. Keep going. This is great. This is great. Just pick yeah, so, modern science. Yeah, okay. I, so modern system science uh, you know, has, has these two uh, genealogies, a kind of shallow and a deep one. And I think that the shallow one is that it comes out of standard uh, engineering and physics in close association with the military industrial complex, actually, because there's a desire to have um, more reliable systems of prediction and control um, for guided missiles and, and, and other such uh, devices. But the science behind that, particularly as it came out of uh, Ludwig von Bertalanffy and, and other cyberneticians and so on, eventually allowed for deeper and deeper understanding of living systems, biological systems, uh, and uh, the relationships between these systems and their environments. So um, all of this eventually got applied to uh, things like climate and uh, planetary systems to give us Earth system science, particularly as it was influenced by Lovelock and Gaia theory. But the deeper question is, you know, where did this sense of system arise? And I think it actually has deeper roots in the religious and philosophical consciousness that um, uh, goes back to the first axial age where there was this insight that we see in, in Taoism, for instance, that, that the, the cosmos is organized by a principle called a Tao, or that uh, there is a divine patterning. The core, I guess, conviction or, or intuition of system science, as, as you know, is that, uh, is that the, the world is intelligible as a whole 
uh, and that no part can be understood in us in isolation uh, from the whole. So, um, but I think this is a fundamentally religious intuition. I think it comes out of a religious intuition originally, even though the scientists have probably forgotten that. But but if you trace the genealogy of system science, I mean, it'll go all the way down in the modern period to Descartes uh, and uh, his conviction <clears throat> that uh, the world is rational and it's rational because it was created by God and God is rational. Um, and you can go all the way down to, you know, Plato uh, in, in the Greek tradition, or you can go to the, the uh, Hebraic tradition and the conviction that um, that the world is uh, uh, the creation of God, and therefore it can be trusted, it can be understood. So, but but the modern sciences have forgotten, I think, the the uh, the deep ancestry and genealogy of their own uh, commitment and uh, to rationality, to wholeness, and it's being rediscovered, as it were, in its in a, in a new way through. Uh, through science and through the investigation, in fact, actual investigation of our world, which is revealing to us the degree to which uh, everything is connected, uh, that we can't uh, we can't understand one thing without being committed to understanding its integral relationship uh, to the whole in which it's embedded. So, uh, and this is being revealed to us not only theoretically, but but in terms of a growing emergency practically, uh, in terms of uh, the global climate in terms of our political economy where everything is connected so yeah the systems view is 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 both a, an intuition and it's being forced upon us as a practical um reality sean i'd love you to tell us a little bit more of you started to say why you think we are in this Gaian era uh, and partly because we are rediscovering the profound interconnectedness of life and life forms. Um, so maybe you could elaborate that a little bit, um, and then I'll come back with another question. Mm. Yeah, well, um, when I think of this question, why are we in this moment? And uh, first of all, what is our moment? I mean, our moment seems to be one simultaneously of increasing uh, planetary crisis and emergency and at the same time and perhaps uh, um, because of that emergency uh, we are waking up to ourselves as planetary beings and even more strongly the planet itself or herself seems to be waking up to herself in a way um, so this is our moment and uh, if I ask myself how, either how or how did this come about, I also think of why is it coming about? Is it is it a purposeful uh, process or is it merely accidental? Um, so if I if I think in terms of how it came about, I see it as being at least, uh, if not completely, significantly determined by the evolution of religious consciousness and its transformations over the last 2,000 years. And I'm not the first to say this. I mean, Lynn White famously, as you know, uh, tried to link the, the birth of modern science and the ecological crisis to uh, certain elements in, in particularly uh, Christianity, but other religious traditions as well. And others have pointed to uh, the elements in many axial traditions that fo the focus on transcendence, anthropocentrism, and so on, that were preconditions for the emergence of the modern worldview, its dualism, uh, its dominator position relative to the non-human world, and so on. So we can think in those terms, but, um, and I think uh, we, we need to. At the same time, however, it seems to me that something intentional is happening, something is wanting to happen, namely uh, the planet herself is trying to wake up through the human, it seems to me, and the human is trying to wake up in a new way uh, uh, to the realization of our uh, indissoluble unity with the rest of the living community. So, um, this seems to be an intentional process to me, and it's 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 the uh, at the core of what uh, 
both Thomas Berry and Ewart Cousins and others have, have called uh, the dawning of a second axial age that's organically related to the first one. Yeah, so why don't you um, just describe briefly, what is this second axial age as, as you understand it? Yeah, well, the second axial, so the first axial age, uh, as you know, like centered around the 6th century BCE when, when uh, the founders of all of the major world religions and great philosophical traditions mysteriously arose at the same time within a couple of centuries of each other and gave birth to these great traditions that uh, not only uh, uh, manifested as religions and philosophies, but eventually seem to have uh, given birth to the modern period and modern science and so on. So we, the, the world as we know it was shaped by these traditions that came out of the first axial age. Um, now we are seem to be witnessing, not seem, we are witnessing uh, an equally uh, mysterious event where people are waking up all over the planet uh, and realizing that something as, as radical as the first, even more radical as the first axial age is happening and needs to happen. We need to birth new traditions that will uh, have a chance at least of preserving the diversity of life on the planet, have a chance of realizing some of the age old dreams of social justice and preserving human dignity <clears throat> that were um, in a sense promises of the first axial age. So the second axial age in a sense is the, you could say is the answer to the first axial age um, uh, in a time of planetary crisis. And, and it's asking us to, to re-engage with the traditions of the first axial age and the ones that existed before then, the indigenous traditions, but now in service of the earth community, which is uh, whose integrity is being threatened. So that's, that's really what the second axial age is about. Thank you. That's uh, really well said. And of course, as you mentioned, relates to our work in religion and ecology, but I love your connection to these various axial ages. Um, which Thomas Berry, as you point out, was the first to use that term, the second axial age, and Ewart Cousins picked it up um, and developed it. So let's conclude um, with the question that we're all asking ourselves, really. What are the resources? What are the tools that are needed uh, for us to move into this period of a more holistic sense of the Earth community um, when we know it is at great risk um, many people feel uh, we've pitched, we've reached a tipping point in terms of the ecosystems, climate change, species extinction, et cetera. It's a very grave moment. Um, mm -hmm. So what, what are the resources? Of course, you've named the world's religions need to come on board uh, and so on with a broader moral, ethical sensibility. But what other things might we um, draw forward? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, along with these traditions that are still alive and still have much to, to gift us, uh, even as we <clears throat> seek to reform many elements of those traditions, along with those traditions, I, I think is the um, increasingly obvious fact of our radical interdependence uh, with each other, socially, politically, and between us and our other than human, um, the other than human community in, in which we're embedded. I mean, it's becoming so critically obvious the degree to which no nation uh, is an island, uh, no community is immune to the uh, pain and suffering of other communities, that the, the human is uh, so dependent upon, interwoven with the other than human, the other creatures and even the air and the water. So this dawning sense of, um, in a sense, existential and cosmological interdependence um, that um, we don't even need a tradition to understand, it's just staring us in the face is, is I think, our greatest resource. So the, the very thing that, that is being threatened, I think, is our greatest resource, as long as we uh, commit ourselves to looking, looking it in the face, to welcoming it with open arms uh, and um, uh, strengthening it to the degree, the degree that we can and even celebrating it in whatever way we can. So that's, that's what I would say. 
That's terrific. Um, and I thank you, Sean. This, this has been wonderful and it really helps uh, extend your paper, your very fine paper. And I think we're delighted um, to think about it, a declaration of interdependence like the Earth Charter is actually out there pointing us in that right direction. Thank um, so thank you so much. And I look forward to continuing the conversation.